to Western Electric. And whether you knew it or not, uh, many of you were probably already Western Electric customers at one time. Uh, those of us of a certain age remember Ma Bell, right? That's where you got your phone service. It was Illinois Bell, the phone company. You didn't go to the shopping mall and talk to some teenager to explain your programs or anything. You know, there was a green truck pulled up in front of your house and a guy with a leather tool belt came in, plugged the phone into your wall, and you better not put any additions onto it, and you better not take that out because it doesn't belong to you. It belongs to the Bell system. Well, Western Electric made all of that hardware. And their main factory, and for many years their only factory, where all of those telephones and all of that equipment was made, was in Cicero, Illinois, at uh, what's now Cermak and Cicero. And it was called the Hawthorne Works, uh, one of the biggest factories in the world. Now, besides just its excellence in manufacturing for all those years, it was a great place to work for the people who worked there. Now, think about the place where you work now or the places you used to work and think about would you say this about your employer? And these are things that employees from the Hawthorne Works have said about it. The employees were treated like family. Loyalty was a fact of life at Western Electric. The plant kept my family going through hard times. There's good conditions, good bosses, and nobody bothers you as long as you do your job. It was a very good way to live. So this was a place that early on, even more than 100 years ago, 1913, they began their pension program, fully paid pension program, medical benefits, paid vacations, et cetera, et cetera. So Western Electric started in the late 1860s. Um, it was two gentlemen named Enos Barton and Alicia Gray who started an electrical apparatus company, and they were making things for Western Union, the telegraph company. Um, and in fact, Mr. Gray invented his own type of telephone, and he submitted his patent application the very same day as Alexander Graham Bell did. Uh, so initially, Mr. Bell had a hard time getting his business started. He offered to sell his patent to Western Union for $100,000 in 1877. They turned him down. They didn't think there was any future in it. They <laughs> saw they were, they used the telegrams, right, for business purposes. It was written word, it would go on the record. The telephone is just voices that go into the air, so who's gonna do that? Um, within a few years, they realized their error, that suddenly they realized people would just wanna get on the phone and yap with each other, right, just the way no one understood that Facebook people would really have a, a penchant for posting you know, videos of kitty cats on skateboards all of a sudden. So um, Western Union asked Mr. Gray and Mr. Barton to start building telephones for them. Um, but Mr. Bell's patent was upheld in court. So that put Western Union out of the telephone business and that put Western Electric almost out of business. But Bell had seen that they were good manufacturers. So as early as 1882, the Bell Company connected with Western Electric to become their official hardware supplier. Now, their first office in Chicago was on Kinsey Street into the 1880s. They expanded, and in the 1890s, they were on Clinton Street. And this building is actually still there, right next to the Eisenhower Expressway today. You can still see it just west of the old post office. Through the 1890s, the telephone business expanded more and more, and they needed a new place to work. So in 1903, they purchased about 200 acres in what was then wide open prairie um, in the eastern edge of Cicero, at uh, Cicero and what was then Cicero Avenue and what was then 22nd Street. Uh, the first building to go up was the, uh, the water tower. And you see that the land there was just wide open. It was pretty much like Norwood Park at the time. This was the edge of the urban built up area. So the factory opened by the next year. Uh, the first employees who were working there had to be trolleyed in by uh, special trolleys that the company had because the streetcar lines ended at 12th Street, which became Roosevelt Road, and Crawford, which became Pulaski. So that last mile west and south they had to brought, be brought in to the new plant. There were about 
5,000 employees at first, a lot of them women who were just doing assembly work at tables. All through its history, uh, Hawthorne employed a lot of women on the facility. This is their foundry. Um, it's called a works and not just a factory because it did the works, everything from beginning to end. Raw materials came in one end of the facility, they were all assembled and put together, and out on the other end came uh, the completed telephones, cables, switching equipment, everything they needed. So they formed everything right on the site. Um, this gentleman is Theodore Vale, who was president of AT&T. And he, more than anybody, even though he's unknown today, he, more than anybody, was responsible for shaping the Bell system as we knew it for most of the 20th century. In the early days, there were competing telephone companies. And AT&T's policy was, we're not going to connect with those other telephone companies. So if you're in the same town, or if your next door neighbor has a different telephone company, you could not call each other. And they stubbornly stuck to that for many years. Theodore Vale decided, let's just connect with everyone so that there will be one uniform service and gradually those other companies will see that it's in their best interest to simply become part of the Bell system, which is what happened. So by about 1911, 1912, the Bell system as we know it is shaping up. And this was how you got your phone service for most of the 20th century. Um, AT&T was the parent company and uh, they also did uh, long distance telephone calls. Western Electric did the hardware and manufacturing. There were 23 operating telephone companies around the country, in our case it would be Illinois Bell. They were the actual service providers. And then from the 1920s on, there was Bell Labs in New Jersey, which did all the research and development. That's a view of the works in about 1913, 1914. Um, you can see it's still wilderness here. There's a cow grazing across what is now Cermak Road. Uh, these are the initial manufacturing buildings here. You can see the top of the water tower over there and the two stacks of their own power plant. So they had their own power plant already. And Kitty Corner, on the northwest corner of Cicero 22nd, there was a flying field in 1914. You can faintly see the works in the background there. But at that time, that intersection in Cicero, you had the most sophisticated communications equipment being built. You had the latest aviation technology. Cicero was the Silicon Valley of its day, 100 years ago. <laughs> now already on the grounds, uh, they gave a lot of space for employees to have uh, recreation, big tennis courts, softball games. This is looking north along Cicero Avenue. And then the early years, the employee club was formed, which was an independent entity which planned all their activities, uh, started up a night school. Um, starting in 1911, they had an outing each summer, one day, where they would take uh, a boat trip across the lake to Michigan City, Indiana. Um, this is in 1914. Uh, some of the lady employees are uh, promoting women's suffrage, votes for women. And then the following year, in 1915, the uh, outing had grown so large that they chartered five boats to go across the lake. But of course, that was the day in uh, 1915 when the Eastland, which was loaded up with 2,500 people, hadn't even departed yet uh, from the pier, capsized in the Chicago River, and 800 people died that day. So a couple years later, when the First World War came along, uh, for the first time, Western Electric became involved in uh, defense production. There were about 20,000 people working there at the time, uh, and because of the men going off to war, about 9,000 of them uh, were women at this time. So they took on a lot of jobs they hadn't done before. They're working on lathes and punch presses and so forth in their, their liberty suits, as they called them. Not terribly attractive, probably not very comfortable, but a lot of women for the first time were doing this factory work. 
And Western Electric was also called on to develop um, aerial radio systems, right? This is the first time in warfare that airplanes are being used. Uh, until that time, none of them had radio communications. So beginning when the U.S. entered the war in April 1917, uh, Western Electric was given the assignment of coming up with the aerial communication system. Within four months, they had developed this headgear with the embedded earphones in it and the air ground communications radios here. This is the gentleman in the suit looking up here. That's Mr. Edward Kraft. He was the head engineer uh, at Bell Laboratories. And uh, we'll see more of him later on. But within four months, uh, Western Electric had developed those devices. This is a Flag Day rally in uh, the summer of 1918 at the Hawthorne Works. And uh, a lot of the employees there were Czech, Slovak, Polish. So they were very interested in the outcome of the war so that their uh, old homelands uh, might become independent. After the war, then the plant expands even more. They added the uh, trademark uh, tower, executive tower, right at the southeast corner of uh, Cicero and 22nd Street. And uh, they were up to about 2 million feet of floor space by that time, and about 20,000 people working there. And that's the cornerstone with, that they laid in 1919 when they uh, built the tower. And uh, we'll see a bit of that again later. But of course, as they usually do, they put a uh, time capsule in there. Through the 1920s, as the economy is booming, uh, people start to want telephones in their house. So there's um, more production than ever at the Hawthorne Works. That's how much the telephone system grew. So from about 300,000 around the turn of the century, there were 17 million phones in American houses by the mid-1920s. And from about 1913 until the mid-1920s, Hawthorne was the only Western electric plant uh, in America. That's quitting time in 1924. So even at 20,000 people at the beginning of the 1920s, that amount of work was doubled during that decade. <coughs> So here, uh, these men are putting um, copper and lead billets into the furnace to melt them down. Um, at that time, 5% of all the lead mined in the United States was going to the Hawthorne Works. Um, huge amounts of, of other uh, materials. Uh, copper, uh, even silk, which they needed for insulating uh, cable. So all of those were brought to the Hawthorne Works. And of course, nothing was wireless back then, so they had to make all the wire and cable. Uh, miles and miles of it every year. And all the switchboards, all the background apparatus, besides the, the consumer's telephones, Western Electric was making all the switching equipment as well. And there's their power plant, which they had to double in size in the 1920s. And, uh, Ironically, they had stopped making generating equipment themselves in the early years, so this is General Electric equipment at Western Electric. But they were generating enough power to light a city of 50,000 people. And that's the water tower, we're looking from the south east. In the lower right-hand corner there, you can see some of the, the coal cars coming in. The power plant burned uh, 10 carloads of coal every day to power the works. They had a hospital on the grounds, um, so employees had uh, medical coverage and they also uh, took care of injured workers on the grounds there. The Hawthorne Club ran the night school by the mid-1920s. They had over 3,000 students in there. Uh, they would conduct courses relevant to work at the factory, so it would be um, electricity and, well, even, you know, stenography and, and office-type courses. In 1927, they opened a gymnasium 
uh, two blocks west along 22nd Street, along with uh, playing fields and clubhouses there. That's inside the gymnasium and ladies volleyball teams, bowling. People used to bowl a lot back then. Nobody bowls anymore, but bowling was a big thing. And the neighborhood grew as well. This is looking straight west from the plant. In 1900, there were 4,500 people in Cicero. By 1920, there were 45,000. And the Hawthorne Club also operated their own savings amount. So the people who were working there were buying houses in the town, in the area. And the major difference is this wasn't a company town like Pullman. Uh, Western Electric did not hold mortgages, they did not collect rent, they did not uh, own the houses of these people. It, uh, Cicero became the, uh, well, in Cicero by 1920 something, had the largest number of homeowners of any town in Chicago because of this. So, of course, the company encouraged thrift, but the savings and loan and the credit union and the school were all run by the employees themselves. This is quitting time in the late 1920s. And you know, I always thought that, that that sunset looked a little too pretty to be Cicero, and it was. I found out later that that was uh, grafted on later. That's an Arizona sunset <laughs> on Cicero. But, but you can see the crowd of the streetcars and all the automobiles, too. Um, people were able to finance their cars uh, through the credit union, the company as well. And there's our friend Mr. Kraft, again, all dressed up to demonstrate um, sound motion pictures, which was an invention of Western Electric. <clears throat> now, the first type of sound movies, and this was the type of sound that was used for the jazz singer, which is widely considered the first uh, full talking movie. But you see he's holding a record there. So the sound was recorded on a disc, which was then be played in sync with the film. There was another system, which Western Electric later bought the rights to, which had the uh, soundtrack on the film itself. And that became the more practical and more common method to use. Uh, that was a familiar logo that you would see on theaters, or if you watch old movies, any movies that were made from like 1927 <coughs> through 1956, uh, take a look at the opening credits and you'll see either this logo for Western Electric or the one for RCA's inferior product. Um, but Western Electric uh, sound, that Western Electric logo meant that the equipment that recorded that movie was made in Cicero. And uh, Western Electric also installed the sound systems in the movie theaters as well. This is Doug Shearer, who became one of the first um, sound experts in Hollywood. Uh, the first 10 Academy Awards given for best sound starting in 1930, all 10 of those went to Western Electric Sound. Doug Shearer eventually collected uh, 12 Oscars in his career for his work with sound in movies. And this is a typical scene uh, in the late 1920s. A lot of women, again, doing bench work, assembly work, and the company's working at an unprecedented rate. They're having to produce a uh, product with a number of people that really hasn't been done before. So they wanted to do a lot of research into how we can maximize production. Um, initially, in the early part of the 20th century, it was simply a matter of time and motion studies. How fast can we make people work, right? There are limits to the human body. There's only so much they can do. Um, so Western Electric was interested in finding out um, other methods. These are relays, which are part of the switching system, a simple piece that ladies like the one we saw on the slide before were put together. So uh, in 1924, General Electric uh, makers of light bulbs sponsored um, research on light levels in work areas. So they would install brighter lights in certain areas and they were hoping that the outcome would be 
The more lights you have, the better your, your workers produce, therefore buy more general electric light bulbs. But the strange thing, thing they were finding was that sometimes they would leave the lights the same, sometimes they would even put in dimmer lights in certain places, but the production still kept going up. There was no correlation between bright light and production. So they were curious about this, and they wanted to do more research on what increases production among workers. So there were relay workers, young ladies, who were putting together these little devices here, which have about 30 little pieces that they put together all day long. So the company decided, along with Harvard researchers, to put six women in a room by themselves, change various conditions over time, whether it be the lighting, the temperature, the length of the day, the break periods, and so forth, and see what effect that would have on their work output. So these are some of the ladies in the relay assembly rooms. And so they were separated there, making their little relays that are coming out of the chute there. And over time, uh, the researchers were seeing that, or at least they concluded, that it wasn't so much any change in the environment, right? You could change uh, the lighting or the, the length of the day, but it was more the informal social group that developed that would make a difference there. They did further tests with um, men in uh, wire assembly rooms, and uh, basically what they found out was that you know people in a group, when they're working together, they will conspire to find ways to make their work less difficult and their profit greater. You know, it's a big surprise. But uh, Hawthorne became known for those experiments, but they're still argued about to this day. Uh, these are the Hello Charlie girls in the early 1930s. They had sort of a beauty contest every year among their ladies. The Hello Charlie name comes from uh, an incident in the late 20s. Uh, the plant was so big at that time, they had their own uh, post office substation there. Someone mailed in a postcard that just was addressed to Charlie at the Hawthorne Works. So they handed it around and they eventually tracked down Charlie. So the story got out. So everyone who worked at Western Electric then was nicknamed Charlie. <laughs> so they had this beauty contest every year for the Hello Charlie Girl. And of course it was a big get together. You know, they like to have their big uh, outdoor events there. So the 20s and 1930 comes along and uh, the bottom drops out of everything that it did for many businesses. You see that over the 1920s, the revenues more than doubled from about 150 million up to four, more than 400 million in 1929. It started to drop off in 1930 and plummeted after that. Now the whole uh, company was based on increasing phone usage in America. The depression came along and not only were there fewer phone, uh, new phones demanded, but 15% of the people who had telephones gave up their phone service. So they're almost down to nothing. So they had reached uh, 40,000 employees at the end of the 1920s. By 1931, 32, that fell to 6,000. Very little work there. This is the, the same gate that we saw in 1924 with the crowds coming out of there. Fortunately, they were still producing uh, sound movie equipment, so about 10% of the people they had left were working on uh, installing speakers and sound systems for theaters. But the rest of the, a lot of the rest of the workers were reduced to things like this. Um, just making, you know, basically things that you'd make in a high school shop class. You got a lot of copper sitting around, you're not making wires, you make copper ashtrays, right? You make little wooden bookends. They were even um, farming out the workers to do handiwork on neighborhood houses, do a little electrical work. Um, those things got pretty desperate for a while in the early 1930s. By the end of the decade, toward the end of the decade, things began to pick up more, and they were, got back up to about 15,000 employment. This is 1940, uh, things were picking up again. They were starting to get more defense contracts as well. And they're hiring a lot more people. This is the 
Brunecki family. Um, family portrait and also a portrait of all Western Electric employees. And that was not uncommon. Eight of the family worked at Western Electric. They all started in the 30s and 40s. Lived in the neighborhood, all worked there for a lot of years. And we'll see, uh, let's see, this gentleman here, we'll see him again later on, Len Brunecki. And then World War II, and once again, they get involved. Um, World War II, well, it's very simple. Western Electric single-handedly defeated the Axis powers, or almost. I'm exaggerating, but only a little bit. The amount of work they did, the amount of production, uh, was amazing. If you just take the city of Chicago alone and consider how much communication equipment was made here, um, the radar equipment, the radios, and this just a Western Electric. Then there was also Zenith, there was Galvin, Motorola, there was Halicrafter, Stuart Warner, um, B-29 engines at Ford City, uh, the Douglas plant up here in Norwood Park. All of that just in the city of Chicago alone. So once again, uh, they got up to 40,000 employees at Hawthorne during the war. Early in the war, um, after the Doolittle raid on Tokyo in uh, April, uh, those B-25s in the Doolittle squadron were equipped with radios that were built at Hawthorne. So they made that public after the raid. By August of that year, uh, Hawthorne was given the E Award, the Excellence, Excellence Award for uh, Defense Production. And yeah, nice little gathering in the yard there of their 40,000 or so people coming out to see the award. Uh, this gentleman is named Doug Leach. By the end of 1942, uh, Doug was an employee at Hawthorne, and he became the 2000th employee of Western Electric to uh, enlist in the armed forces. Uh, he joined the Army Air Force. He was a truck driver on the grounds, and his wife stepped in and took his job. And he said, hello, Charlie girls. They kept that contest going during the war. Keep morale up. This young lady is named Jenny Shearer. She was the 1941 Hello, Charlie girl. And this gentleman is uh, Bob Brook, who was from Cicero. Um, and before the US entered the war, he joined the volunteer Flying Tigers in Burma and China. And he was flying there already for more than a year um, as a fighter pilot uh, before the US entered the war. When the US came in, he came home and entered the uh, US Armed Forces. Um, he was from Cicero, so he got a parade down Cermak Road. You know, what more could you ask for if you're a kid from Cicero? Uh, big day, all of his own, and he took a tour of the Hawthorne Works, escorted by Ginny Shearer, the Hello Charlie girl. So they stayed in touch through the fall. Uh, he went to a new assignment as a flight instructor down in Orlando. And uh, November of that year, they were married. He married the Hello Charlie girl. This is actually at the, the Oak Park Arms Hotel. Um, so they were married at the end of November. Um, December 20th of 42, he was killed in a training accident. Uh, one of the items that they built at Hawthorne was this gun director, which was the most advanced equipment for its time. Uh, this device here is an electronic tracker uh, using radar. It could uh, track incoming aircraft, determine their speed, uh, the distance, and their direction, and then feed that into an analog computer. And the whole unit together could then automatically aim the weapon. So this is the device that was made at Western Electric. And the gun itself was made by Chevrolet. Uh, so this device together uh, worked, uh, that was shooting down um, rocket weapons and uh, enemy aircraft in 44 and 45. And that's some of the, the outfits that the uh, ladies at the works were wearing in the wartime. And 
they turned on a lot of radar equipment. About half of the radar equipment used by the U.S. Armed Forces came from Hawthorne Works. And the radar testers in 1945. And this was in May of 44. Uh, there was an um, Armed Forces radio concert for Hawthorne workers. This is at the Chicago Stadium. And they got to see the Tommy Dorsey band with Gene Krupa on the drums. So not a bad night there. So this is just the totals for 1943. $575 million worth of military equipment produced at Hawthorne. And so there's the, the gun director devices that we saw, various telephone apparatus, radios. About a third of it is top secret equipment. It did a lot of uh, headphones, microphones, for air, for ships, all of those. So through the war, their totals came to, by the end of the war, they did $2 billion worth of government contracts, um, produced 56,000 radar units, 1,600 of the gun directors that we saw, uh, a million aircraft radios, receivers and transmitters, um, 150,000 receivers for tanks and artillery, almost 2 million microphones, more than a million headsets, 4 million miles of cable for uh, telephone systems. Now, 1946, war's over. Everybody wants to get back to consuming stuff, right? Um, just like with automobiles, which weren't made for civilians during the war, you could not get a telephone in your house during the war years. So by 1946, there's a backlog of two million orders for telephones. Um, Western Electric took over a Studebaker plant on Archer Avenue and uh, Use that to turn out, let's see, what did they do that year? 3.2 million phones in 46 and 4 million in 1947. That backlog. Um, by 1945, the plant has been there for 44 years already. Uh, the gentleman in this photo, what they have in common besides uh, white shirts and receding hairlines is that all of them had at least 40 years of service with Western Electric. Yeah. And that was not uncommon. There's, let's see, the story from 55 here, somewhere, that in that year, 25%, yeah, by the 50th anniversary of the plant in 1955, there were 21,000 people still working there. A quarter of them had 25 or more years with the company. 9,000 had 15 years, and there were 4,500 4, workers on pension with the company. The restaurants and cafeterias were turning out 27,000 meals every day. And some of you probably recognize this weird structure. This was along Fullerton at Normandy, yes. and that was Western Electric as well. They took over another plant uh, at Normandy and Fullerton, and they were building radar equipment there. This was a radar test stand. Um, so from like 51 to 63, that was another um, Western Electric plant in the area. 1952, Western Electric built the telephone system for the SS United States, the luxury ocean liner, um, largest floating telephone system in the world. By the mid-1950s, um, there were other plants opening in the Western Electric Company. Uh, Columbus was one. From 1949 on, um, Indianapolis took over production of the telephone handsets. So from that point on, you know, those Model 500 telephones that we were so familiar with, those were made in Indianapolis. But Hawthorne was still making the switching equipment and a lot of the wire and cable. There were other plants that opened in Omaha, Oklahoma City, several other places, which reduced the number of people who were working at Hawthorne. But still, in the early 50s, they 
expanded their powerhouse. They were still generating their own electricity. Late 1950s, uh, they still had enough people that they sponsored another study. Now this one isn't as well known as the earlier studies. I think it, it's more important. Um, but it was just a very simple health study. They monitored um, about 2,000 Hawthorne workers and they had to do nothing. They didn't have to change their habits or anything. They just had to monitor what they were eating, uh, how much activity and so forth. And you know, it was very easy. I mean, this is 1957, right? The golden age of couch potatoes when you could just, you know, chain smoke a pack of Lucky Strikes and no one would be bothered for it. But over the course of 20 years, they monitored the health of these 2,000 people working at Hawthorne. And the results of these tests, these were the first tests that connected a high cholesterol level to heart disease. And they also found that um, more vegetables and more specifically beta carotene in your diet might reduce your cancer risk. So the results of this study are still being uh, examined. <coughs> We're still drawing data from them. In the early 60s, as the space program starts, uh, Western Electric and Hawthorne were producing equipment for Cape Canaveral. They produced the, uh, the ground communication system at Cape Canaveral. By the mid-60s, right, we're getting into smaller and smaller switching equipment, um, mainly because of Bell Laboratories' invention of the transistor back in 1947. But uh, Western Electric and Hawthorne were still producing uh, the more sophisticated equipment like this. The plant was updated uh, in a lot of ways, but still there was no need for as large a plant as they were anymore. And the plant itself was, was getting older uh, and needed repair. It's approaching 60 years old at this time. In 1978, they celebrated their 75th anniversary. These are some of the retirees who came back, uh, thousands and thousands of retirees with pensions and health insurance from the company. By the early 1980s, the Bell system as we knew it was broken up. Um, the system really could have been the subject of an antitrust suit at any time over those 80 years, but no one really wanted to take it on, and no one really knew what the outcome would be. Um, the last 30 years or so, we've been dealing with the outcome of this. Um, it was probably inevitable, but um, you know, now you can see that even though the AT&T and the Bell system were split up, you kind of see it coming back together again. And so it's almost a natural monopoly, just the way AT&T said it was. By the early 1980s, uh, a lot of the space was unused at Hawthorne. Some of the older buildings uh, were taken down at that time. In 1983, they announced the closing of the plant, uh, which really wasn't related to the breakup of AT&T. Um, probably would have happened anyway, or Hawthorne would have existed as, as a much smaller facility. So by 1987, what was left of the building itself was brought down. So there's that cornerstone, uh, remember from 1919, they, they took that out. There's some retirees posing with that same cornerstone that they took out of the tower. And where that is today, I don't know. It looks like they might be inside the tower base, but who knows where that cornerstone is today. Uh, this is a picture of the band at the base of the water tower, the marching band, about mm, maybe a hundred or more years ago. It's the same spot today. The water tower is still standing there, but uh, most of the rest of the plant is still gone. The wire and cable building is still there along Cermak, just um, east, well, a few blocks east of Cicero. And that's a Cook County warehouse today. And the main gates uh, that used to be <clears throat> on Cicero Avenue, uh, that gate is now at uh, St. James at Sag Bridge Church. If you go down Archer Avenue out in Lamont, those are the old gates from the Hawthorne Works that they have there. And the old SS United States, well, it's 
It's tied up to a pier in Philadelphia now, rusting away. Uh, all that wiring inside was uh, sold for scrap years ago. And Len Brunetti, who was over here with his family, um, he's 95 years old now. And he had been transferred to Omaha, so he's retired in Missouri now. Been retired since 1980, collecting a Western Electric pension. So I mean, that's the legacy of the company, that uh, normally when you think of some huge industrial operation in the early to mid 20th century in the United States, you don't think of a place that treated people well. You don't think of a place where people built a future for themselves. Um, but that's what Hawthorne was. Uh, the company made a simple decision that it's in our benefit to treat our people decently and to give them a leg up in life. And people worked hard. They benefited for it. Um, their children and grandchildren have benefited for it. So, unfortunately, places like that are few and far between today. So, that's the story of Western Electric and the Hawthorne Works. So that. Okay. And I have some company publications up here. If you want to hear. Yes? I have a question that you um, showed your chart showed that um, the number of phones dropped sharply, the Great Depression phones. Mm -hmm. What percentage of phones do you think really had telephones then? Like it was approaching 50% by the end of the 1920s. Yes. Oh. So yeah, it was growing, you know, rapidly in the same way that any other new technology, you know, the way TV ownership exploded after World War II, the way internet connections exploded in the last 15, 20 years. Same thing, but it was, it was really halted and turned back during those years. And so you said you couldn't get a telephone during, um, during the war. The war. Mm -hmm. um, those that had telephones, though, would they they could still use them? They could, but even then, you know, if you look through the magazines, then you'll see a lot of ads, even ads put in by the Bell system, uh, telling people, limit your calls, you know, quit yakking on the phone, don't you know there's a war on, you know, reserve it for emergency calls. So they were encouraging people, either make your phone calls late at night, uh, you know, the servicemen or emergency calls could get through, and limit it to five minutes. Yes. Dennis, though, what's the, is there a relationship to Teletype Corporation? Yeah, they, um, I don't know if they were owned by Western Electric or AT&T. AT&T was the parent company, but yeah, Teletype was part of the whole Bell system. Yeah, I remember you could use to be able to see the legacy of Teletype in the Bell Trust and Shopping Center. Mm -hmm. And some of the old uh, building, now it's the, the legacy part is gone. Mm -hmm. But the parking structure, I think, was still part of the original telephone plant. Yeah. Yes. How did you get interested in this? Um, well, my grandfather was Bell Telephone, my father was Bell Telephone for you know, 30 years, and then I worked at Morton College for a time in Cicero, and they had a museum there uh, dedicated to the Hawthorne Works. And I had the chance to talk to, to some of the retirees and hear their stories, and. Uh, learned a lot about uh, this factory. I didn't know much about it myself. I just knew once there was this big place down there, and once there was a company called Western Electric. Um, but yeah, I, I didn't know how vast it was and, and all the things that it was responsible for. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, any connection uh, having to do with the Hawthorne Race Course? Um, just the location. Okay. And that <coughs> subdivision along Cicero there was called Hawthorne at the time right. that they started building it. Yeah. Okay, and there used to be a, a racetrack in that area that's also gone. Um, they used it for NASCAR, you know, this is quite some time. Or just yeah, there was Hawthorne and Sportsman's. Sportsman's, Sportsman's, Sportsman's yeah. Park. That was, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No connection whatsoever? No, just location. Okay. They're very close to each other. Yes. Fabulous job. Thank you. Uh, my main question was, how did you get interested too? But uh, since you already answered that, did they uh, run multiple shifts? Oh yeah, yeah. They were so twenty-four seven. Oh, yeah, okay. That's what yeah. I'm Part of the time, you know, especially during the war, oh, they yeah. were they were doing twenty-four seven. Um, but yeah, I, I knew 
some people, I spoke to some retirees who spent their whole careers working in the graveyard shift. Yes? Yeah, you mentioned during the war with the large number of employees that they would employ as I worked, if this was back in the late 60s, maybe early 70s, at a plant called Melco Chemical, which was at 71st and Pulaski, mm -hmm. right next to the Ford plant. And one of the old electricians would just enjoy telling the story that during the war, he would be able to collect two paychecks, him and his buddy, because they would cross through the fence and one would punch each other in and every other day. And they had so many employees he mentioned that they had no idea who was working and where. Yeah, there were big operations yes. and you know, it was very lucrative for workers. There were decent pay and, and uh, overtime pay for uh, assembly work. And it was just the nature of the work back then that you needed that many hands to put things together. These were all places where they made something that you could hold in your hands. And they needed a lot of people. And it's just different nature, even with manufacturing now, that the things are much smaller, uh, much more precise, and you do not need that many hands doing it anymore. And then also you mentioned, you know, there aren't many companies like that nowadays. I heard today on the public radio, they mentioned that Sears yeah, I saw canceled that. All their health insurance. Yeah, for retirees. For all retirees. Yeah. Hold it. I, I worked for them for 10 years. Yeah, I was laid off from that place too. So, yeah, I'm sure, you know, Julius Rosenwald is turning over in his grave. I mean, that was another person who saw an obligation on the part of management, on the part of, of even the founder of a company to share the wealth or to be fair with people. Whereas in in other cases, uh, you know, take Henry Ford, for example. It was just, uh, for him, that's my name on the factory. That's my house. You're in my house. You do, you know, whatever I tell you to do. And, you know, Ford had to hire a thousand workers every year to keep a hundred positions filled because that many people would get out of there. Right? That's what Western Electric was looking to get past, and they succeeded in it. And it's a no-brainer, really. Treat people with respect, and they're going to stay there, and they're going to be loyal to the company, and they're going to do a good job for you. And they feel like they're part of something bigger than themselves. Was the plant unionized? Yeah. Um, they resisted unions for a while. Uh, it was just, they did a lot of scrutiny of job applicants in the early years, and that's why you saw a lot of families there, because if somebody could recommend you, you'd get in. If anybody was a known labor agitator, they weren't going to get in there. But then at the same time, in the mid-30s, when the CIO was trying to organize the plant, they, they couldn't get any traction because the workers would tell them, what can you do for me that I'm not already getting right now? You know? So the company's attitude was, we'll show you, we'll give you better benefits than any union could ever give you. And the workers said, oh, okay, it works for me. You know? uh, after the war, they uh, were <coughs> AFL, they were IBEW affiliated. Did they make any um, products for other companies? That, uh, in the early years, and then in the mid 1920s, uh, they stopped, you know, doing job work like that because um, AT and T wanted them to be devoted strictly to uh, telephone apparatus. Which, again, when the depression hit a few years later, that really hurt them because they had no other field to go into. They were strictly funneling everything into AT and T. Did they let people go during the Depression, or did they find other jobs? They tried hard at first, you know, shortening hours, shortening the work week, uh, down to four days. They cut out overtime, they cut pay, but yeah, they went down from 40000 to about six or 7000 at the worst. Yeah? Uh, okay, so I had an aunt who worked at uh, Western Electric in the early 1950s, so mm -hmm. I knew that connection. But what I didn't realize was that the radar testing site at Fullerton and Normandy yeah. was a Western Electric site. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember being in high school, it was, we called it the, the highway ramp to nowhere, because yeah. that's kind of what it looked like. That's what we did. Yeah, yeah. right, yeah, exactly. Uh, but later, uh, in the mid-1990s, I actually have a connection to that site, uh, because 
that site was something, a project that I was working on to, to bring Home Depot to Chicago. Yeah. And that was the site that was chosen, and the city of Chicago helped fund the infrastructure issues. And the issue was that the concrete, there was this layer of concrete across the entire site that was like a foot or more thick, and it didn't have utilities under it, and pretty much nobody wanted to invest in that site because how do you build on this? So mm -hmm. all of that had to be broken up, and the highway ramp to nowhere had to be removed. Uh, but Home Depot is there today, so please shop there. Yeah, that's how most of it turns out. I mean, this, the site of the Hawthorne Works itself today is a shopping center. There's movie theaters, there's you know Dollar Tree, Menards, and so forth, and that's what it all turns into. Yeah. Yes. A couple of comments. Mm -hmm. This is the 100th anniversary of the National Football League uh -huh. this year. George Ellis yeah. was employed during the summer in 1915 yeah. at Western Electric, and that was the year of the Eastland disaster. He overslept. Mm -hmm. And missed the, by the time he arrived at the dock where the east one was, which we was supposed to board, had already capsized. Yeah. So if he not slept uh, later, arrived on time, he probably wouldn't have the uh, Decatur Staley's and the <laughs> Chicago and, Bears, or maybe and his, not even his the football. future wife he met there as well. She worked at Hawthorne. Oh, is that so, right? Yeah. You know, without Hawthorne, there wouldn't have been uh, Virginia McCaskey either. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> the, the other point I want to make is because of the telephone. Mm -hmm. In 1948, during the uh, Harry Truman, um, George Dewey. Tom Dewey, yeah. Was it George Dewey? Tom Dewey. Huh? Dewey. Tom Dewey. Yeah, Tom Dewey, Tom Dewey. Uh, presidential campaign. Mm -hmm. Posters told, uh, called people on the telephone to see which way they would vote. And the majority of them told them they were voting for Thomas Dewey. Mm -hmm. But what the posters didn't factor in was that the people who could afford telephones at that time mm -hmm. were primarily at families with money. So basically the poll was lopsided because the posters predicted Dewey was going to Dewey was going to win and then Harry Truman won in 1948. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot, most, I'd say a majority of households by that time had telephones, but back in those days you still had a lot of uh, party lines, and it wasn't until the early 1950s that long distance calls could be made without operator assistance. And there were still a lot of rural areas um, that had to have just operator assisted calls for any call at all. They didn't even have dial exchanges yet. Yep. Maybe you can clear up an old wife's tale that I heard about Bob Bell. You mentioned early in the presentation that all the equipment was owned by Bob Bell. The yeah. jack in your wall, the yep. wiring and everything else. I was told a story a long time ago that if you attached other jacks, uh, they would test the line by sending a signal through where your, your phone would ring just once and they would know who had one phone or two phones, and they would mm -hmm. regulate that signal. And if it didn't ring, they knew you had more phones mm -hmm. tapped on. I don't know about that for sure, but it sounds like something they would do, because they, they guarded that jealousy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they, uh, you know, you did not own that phone. You were leasing it, so that over the lifetime of a phone, you know, you're paying for it many times over, and the bell system is profiting from that. So it was a nice deal for them. But that was also motivation for them to make a very sturdy farm, which they did. It was, you know, long-lasting equipment. My old house. It did happen to me. I called out the house. Well, they so didn't open the door, but when they tested yeah. it. Yeah. And they said, oh, we see you have an external bell, telephone, telephone bell. It was from 1938. Yeah. <laughs> so I said, what is that yours? Yeah. Would you like to buy it? Uh, how much? Twenty-seven dollars. Come and get it. No, they never yeah. did. But from 1938, they're still saying, "Will we own that bell?" Mm -hmm. Yeah, at that, that time. Well, it wasn't until that time that 
the telephone itself was, was contained in one device with a bell in it. Like yeah, the, the old candlestick phones, phones had to have a separate bell box. It was box. It was up until like I think it was the Model 300 about 1938. That was the first one that had the bell That's inside right the phone. phone. Yes. Uh, I remember a time with my parents. Uh, I, I, maybe when we moved to Addison Street, I don't know. They had a phone installed, mm -hmm. and at that time, if you had a phone any color that wasn't black. You had to pay more in the bill. Yep. I mean, you know, <laughs> it's like really, you know, whatever. So, but the guy installing the phone only had a white phone in his van. Installed the white phone and announced it was black. <laughs> <laughs> this is a black phone. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Anybody asks you, yeah. it's black. Yeah. Okay. And you weren't allowed to put any other attachments on them. They they fought tooth and nail against other companies that came up with other attachments and other devices with phones. That over time became indefensible and that's part of what led to the breakup of the system because they were holding you know, such a monopoly on the equipment itself. Um, over the years there had been a couple of lawsuits in like, well the FCC in the 1930s came about in large part because of the Bell system. They wanted to keep tabs on them. Uh, the Bell system that AT&T had from early on always submitted to uh, getting their rates approved by local or state governments. And that dated from like you know, the days of Theodore Vail. He was, he was not going to fight the government over these things. In fact, at that time when, when Vail was in charge, 1912 or 13, AT&T bought a majority interest in Western Union. And the government began to take a look at them. He divested, he didn't fight that. Um, but later on, I think 1949, there was another lawsuit, and at that time is when they had to divest the sound movie business. So you see, after 1956, there's no more Western Electric uh, movie sound. Dennis, the yeah. phone you brought over here, is that one of their phones? Yep, it had to be. I mean, from that era yeah, because uh, up to the mid-1920s. Well, from about 1913 to 1925, Hawthorne was the only uh, Western Electric plant in the country. And they opened another one in Kearney, New Jersey, right. and another one in Baltimore in 29. But yeah, whenever you see one of those candlestick telephones, 99% uh, certain that was made at Hawthorne. I think there's still quite a few of them out there. Yeah. Yeah, I know someone in uh, Irving Park who still has one on their kitchen wall, and mm -hmm. they still use it. Yeah. Sure, <laughs> why not? They love it. That's good stuff. <laughs> that is. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, any other questions? Thanks for listening.